Welcome to the Free Library of Philadelphia. My name is Andy Cahan. I'm director of author events here. Tonight, I have the pleasure of introducing two journalists well known for their work at the Philadelphia Inquirer. A sports columnist at the Inquirer since 2013, Mike Sielski is the author of a number of books, including Fading Echoes, the true story of two Pennsylvania high school football rivals who later found brotherhood while in the US military. And he is the co-author of How to Be Like Jackie Robinson, a collection of life lessons taken from the trailbla trailblazing baseball legend. In 2015, Sielski was voted to the best sports columnist in the US by the Associated Press Sports Editors. His new book, The Rise, Kobe Bryant and the Pursuit of Immortality, referred to by Bob Costas as a story informed by meticulous research and rendered with clear-eyed insights, is an exploration of the identity and making of an icon and the effect his development had on those around him. Tonight, he'll be in conversation with Michael Days, formerly the Philadelphia Inquirer's managing editor, vice president for diversity and inclusion, and editor for reader engagement. Days now serves on the board of visitors at Temple University's Klein College of Media and Communication. Please welcome Mike Sielski and Michael Days. So since we're both journalists, you know, I want to jump in, jump into the deep end initially. Uh, this is a terrific book. Oh, and thanks. I know, and I know, I know a little bit about writing books, uh, and I know how long it takes and how long the editing takes. You did this, uh, Kobe Bryant has not been dead two years, so you did this in about a year or so. Yes, that's right. So we're gonna talk a lot about Kobe, but let's talk a little bit about you. Okay. Uh, this is a labor of love, isn't it for you? It, it really, happened? yeah, it really was. Um, so I guess about a month or two after Kobe, when, when Kobe died in 2020, um, I ended up writing about him a fair amount for the Enquirer, obviously, because of his ties to Lower Marion. So I wrote about half a dozen columns, and at one point I, approached his high school coach, a guy named Greg Downer. Um, I wanted to approach him at the, about the prospect of writing a story about Kobe kind of through Greg's eyes. You know, Greg had this up close and personal look at this kind of shooting star uh, on the basketball court. So I called him up, and it, this was finally about a month or two after Kobe had died. And Greg says, well, as it turns out, I just got back from the memorial service in Los Angeles for Kobe. And on the plane ride back, I wrote down some thoughts uh, about my relationship with him and what he meant to me. Why don't I send them to you? You can take a look at them, and we will maybe we could run a co bylined kind of piece in the Inquirer. So I said, great. And they were really poignant. Uh, the writing was really well done, very personal. And so once I read what Greg had written, I thought, you know, there's a story here that I feel like people in the Philadelphia area probably know pretty well but that the general public around the country and around the world may not be as familiar with. And the elevator pitch line that I came up with was, I wanted to do Batman Begins for the Black Mamba. I wanted to show how the 17 years that Kobe spent directly connected to the Philadelphia area, that if you told that story in the right way, you could see the man that he became through those early years. Um, and there was a lot of drama to that story. There was a life in Europe for part of that time. There was uh, a state championship run in 1996. There was a young man's search for his identity uh, as an athlete, as a black teenager in this kind of posh suburban community. Um, there was the idea that Lower Marion, you say that, you say that those two words and certain stereotypes come to mind and I wanted to kind of dive deeper into the history of that community and the kind of setting uh, that Kobe came back to uh, when he returned and when he and his family returned from Italy. Never mind his family, never mind his recruiting process, all of that kind of stuff. So um, I knew Greg, I knew a couple other people who were connected to Lower Marion and to Kobe, and from there I was able to kind of take off on the project. So, you know, and I will admit to starting a book feeling like, well, you know, He's writing about a, a kid of th three years old who's really sort of really strong willed at that point and strong willed through entire life. But I really was stunned by his determination, uh, his, uh, his, his ability to 
look at himself and think about what do I need to do to be the star I want to be. Uh, so f from the beginning to end, there were a lot of surprises for me. When you started reporting on this thing, which most of it, you know, if, I don't know if folks have had time to read it, the stuff people don't know. Yeah, you know, <laughs> it's funny. Um, everybody, if, if you're familiar at all with Kobe's basketball career, you understand how determined he was and how driven he was to success to the point where he gave himself his own nickname. Right? Nobody gave him the nickname the Black Mamba. He called himself that. Um, but to me, the most surprising part about researching his life was coming to understand how driven and determined he was at such a young age. As you said, three years old, dunking the basketball in his parents' house. Um, knowing at age 14 or 15, it's, it's, it's kind of fitting. I, I see out in the, in the crowd we have here a couple people who are connected to me through my high school years. And to, to learn about what Kobe was, how he was kind of living and how he was approaching his life when he was 14, 15, knowing that in his bones he wanted to be the best basketball player on the planet, and the lengths that he was willing to go to to pursue that goal, I, I still can't get over that. Like, at age 15, I, I could barely work up the courage to talk to a member of the opposite sex. And Kobe is doing whatever he feels he has to do to become a great basketball player. You know, he's, he's, he and a friend are driving around to the courts in West and North Philadelphia and in Ardmore, and they're, they're playing a weird kind of version of pickup ball where his buddy has to rebound for him and his buddy has to scream insults at him. You're, you go to a soft, you're soft. You go to a white school. You couldn't play in the public league. And Kobe wants him to do this so that he'll be girded for whatever's coming down the pike, either in high school or whatever his basketball career is going to be beyond that. And so I, I kind of never stopped being amazed by that idea that at 14, 15, 16, he was preparing for something beyond whatever he was doing at Lower Marion High School. Tell, tell the story about was he a junior in high school when he'd get up almost in the middle of the night and he'd go to the gym, yes. Lower Marion Gym, and work out for what, th two or three hours? Yes, so senior year before, and he would do this throughout his, his career in high school, but particularly before his senior season, kind of when all the pressure was on. They had, they had made the district championship game when he was a junior, and they had lost, and they had lost early in the state playoffs that year, so he came back wanting to win a state championship, and there was a presumption that the team was going to win a state championship that year. So he would pick up a friend. Uh, he would leave his house dead of night, I mean, we're talking 5 a.m., you know, drive the two miles from his house, his family's house in Remington Road in Lower Marion to the high school. And he would get there before the principal, before the teachers, before any other students. A janitor would let him in. Janitor would have to turn the heat on in the building and it would take five to 10 minutes for the, the school to warm up. And he would shoot for an hour or two. Um, and what to me was interesting about that, that, I mean, obviously that shows his determination, but what to me was interesting about that was he would park in one of the prime parking spots on the high school's campus. And <laughs> here's the value of research. That in and of itself is like, oh, who does this kid think he is? But then you do the research, and I went back at the Lower Marion Historical Society, which had copies of the old student newspapers, the Marionite. And I found one that had a news story that pointed out that during the time that Kobe was doing that, there was construction going on at and around the high school. So there were usually about 70 parking spots around Lower Marion High School. When he was doing that, there were actually only about 20 available. And he was taking one that would belong to a faculty member or an administrator. And people, they kind of let him do that. And the way, you know, you can totally see him justifying it by saying, you know what, I'm gonna be better at my job than the principal is at his job, than all these teachers are at their jobs, than all my classmates are gonna be at their jobs when they get them, so I'm gonna park here. And nobody, I mean, if, if anybody objected, it was all kind of scuttlebutt, it was all, oh, who does Kobe think he is? But none of the administrators or faculty members told him not to park there. And he really brought back basketball at Lower Marion, didn't he? I mean, I, I, it was interesting being a city, uh, city boy, reading about how people were much more interested in soccer at that point than yeah. basketball. Because in the city, basketball Yeah, in the city, everything. in the city's basketball is everything. And that gets to the, the point I made earlier about 
the culture at Lower Merion and the impression and images, a lot of it based in reality, that people had of the community, right? Before Kobe comes along, um, the basketball team is, play, is using mis mismatched uniforms. Uh, he enters the school in 1992. They'd won a district championship about 14 or 15 years before that, but it was not a school known for basketball. It was known, a school known for academics. It was a school known for being on the main line and everything that that connotes. Um, and here he comes, and they go 4-20 and 20 his freshman year, which ought to be impossible when you think about it. You have Kobe Bryant on your team. How do you go 4-20? and 20? Um, And in fact, one of, the, one of the four wins they had that season was in the second game of the year against my alma mater, Upper Dublin. Um, I was a senior at the time, and Kobe was just a freshman. Um, I wasn't on the team. I, I didn't need to have him dunk on my head or anything like that. Um, but he changes that culture. He kind of makes basketball cool again at the school. It's not just, oh, the lacrosse team is where it's at, or the soccer team is where it's at, or, hey, you play football, that's kind of cool. It's, oh, basketball is a happening now. And what it does is it brings together all the entire community in a way that none of those sports ever could because there's, there's a, a history and a side to Lower Marion that's not just the stereotypical old money. It is, there's Ardmore, where back in the early 20th century, you know, that's where black families would live and kind of became their part of the area uh, and other kind of pockets of Lower Marion Township. And it, this is something that the entire community can rally around, whether you're black, whether you're white, whether you know a little, you know, you love basketball, you don't love basketball, here's the best player in the entire country, best teenage player in the entire country, and he's in our backyard, he's going to his hometown high school, and let's get on board the train. You know, I, I think I, when I got through the book, I was still a little conflicted. Was this a kid who was just really stuck on himself, or was a kid who really just wanted to do well and really wanted to please people, wanted to please his friends? Is it somewhere in between with him? I think it is somewhere in between. Um, I think he's, Kobe is kind of the perfect melding of, of, I get asked a lot, was it nature or nurture with Kobe? Was he born to do what he did or did he grow up that way? And um, I think it's the perfect melding of both. There was clearly something within him that pushed him and drove him uh, to be great. You know, you see that at, at the earliest of ages. He loves basketball, it, he's immersed in it. But he also had a family that would allow him to pursue that passion and set up a structure in place, set a structure up so that he could. Um, you know, Joe and Pam were very rigorous in terms of how they parented their three kids uh, when it came to academics and how they interacted with adults and how they interacted with other people. But when it came to Kobe and basketball, they were very indulgent. Um, he really could, could do no wrong in that regard. And, you know, you have Joe who was a ter tremendously talented player, a schoolyard legend in Philadelphia, great high school player, great college player. His NBA career doesn't go as well as he hoped it would go. He's kind of ahead of his time. He's six foot nine at a time when if you were six foot nine, they put you near the basket and he could go behind his back, he could dribble, he could do anything on the court. He was kind of like Magic Johnson before Magic Johnson showed up. But nobody knew what to do with him. And he was a bit of a, of a free spirit and an heir to well, so he didn't have that kind of intensity that Kobe always had. But he had the experiences of having gone through the NBA and not having the greatest experience, having to go to Europe to reach his fulfillment as a basketball player. And then you have Pam Bryant, who her family, the Cox family, is raised devoutly Catholic, the disciplinarian in the house, very strong woman, very intelligent woman, and you can see where Kobe gets that from. Mm -hmm. So um, to answer your question, I think he was most secure in himself on a basketball court in the, in the years that I, I cover. Um, and I do think he was kind of trying to find himself away from that. Uh, you know, there's a period where he's trying to fit in. He, he kind of drops out of the sky in the fall of 1991 and when the family moves back from Italy and he ends up at Ballakinwood Middle School. He plays baseball and there's a photograph of his eighth grade yearbook of the baseball team. And every kid in it has a, a baseball cap and a glove, except Kobe. He's wearing um, a sweater that I can best describe as it would have been appropriate for 
someone on the Cosby Show to have worn this sweater, if you know the style from the 80s. Um, he's got a white button down and the sweater's over it, and he's just there. He's the one kid in the photo who doesn't really belong. Um, but through basketball, he's able to assimilate into the community amongst his peers. You know, he's finally able to connect with kids through that. He's able to connect with kids who like rap music. He's able to connect with kids who are also taking honors English, which he is doing, and he ends up bonding with his 10th grade English teacher. So basketball was his way in. Um, and so he could live in those two worlds. He could be supremely confident with a basketball in his hands, and he could be like a lot of teenagers um, when it wasn't. Do you think he would have been as, success, as success, successful as he was if he had stayed in Italy until he was oh, much older? No, I don't think so. And I think he knew that. I think because when the family would come back in the summertime and then once it came back to stay in Wynwood, he would play basketball in the Sunny Hill League, you know, the, the prestigious summer league where if you have any ability and you're in and around the city of Philadelphia, that's where you're going to play to see and be seen. And he knew intrinsically, you know what, I can't just exist in my little Lower Marion bubble or my Italian bubble and be everything I want to be in the sport of basketball. I've got to test myself against the best of the best at my age group and even a little bit older than that. And you see that um, particularly, I think, in the summer of 1995 where he gets invited by John Lucas, who was the Sixers coach at the time, uh, to scrimmage and play pickup against NBA players and college players. Back then, there, were no, there was no real summer league in the NBA. Guys just played, you know, they filled their summer days by playing pickup. And there were games at St. Joseph's University, and John Lucas had seen Kobe play and invites him to come play with Jerry Stackhouse, who was the Sixers' first-round pick the year before, and Rick Mahorn, and all these Division I college players from the area. And Kobe is holding his own and then some against these guys. And... He needed to do that, I think, in his head so that he would know, okay, this dream of going straight from high school to the NBA, it's not a pipe dream. I can, I can actually make it reality. And that's, that summer is really a turning point for him um, because the idea of going to college and taking a less direct route to his, in his mind to success goes out the window. Did anybody else believe him other than his dad that he could go right to the NBA at a high school? Very few people did. Um, and part of that is a matter of circumstance, because it was 1996. The year before that, Kevin Garnett uh, had been the first high school player in 20 years to jump straight from high school to the NBA. But Kevin Garnett was seven feet tall and was a man at age 18. Kobe Bryant was six foot six, you know, thin as a pipe cleaner for most of his high school career, played guard. The idea that a kid like that, built like that, just physically, could make the jump, people couldn't conceive of that. Um, never mind the fact that he played guard, never mind the fact that the NBA regarded high school players as incredibly risky. So the idea that he would just go, and never mind the fact, especially, that he played at Lower Marion High School. Um, it wasn't like he was playing at a ba basketball factory. Um, right. You know, nowadays, nowadays a kid like Kobe would be at Monteverde Academy or IMG Academy in Florida. He was playing for his community high school. So, like, really? Like, yeah, you beat Ridley, but what makes you think you're going to be able to go against MJ, you know? Um, and so there was a lot of that kind of working against him in public perception. Uh, in terms of who thought he could do it, he did. His parents. Uh, Jeremy Treatman, who was uh, a confidant and friend of his, who was kind of an assistant coach slash media relations rep for Lower Marion his senior year. And most importantly, as it turned out, in a way, Sonny Vaccaro thought he could do it. Um, and that, you know, Sonny was the sneaker mogul who signed Michael Jordan to Nike and then left Nike and ended up signing Kobe to Adidas. And Sonny got on the Kobe train early on, and he was right to do so. I was very intrigued that he loved Michael Jordan. He used to study Michael Jordan videos and thought he'd be, just be better than Michael Jordan. I guess. He, would, he would watch Michael Jordan videos on dates. He had kind of a quasi... <laughs> He had kind of a quasi-girlfriend throughout the four years of high school before the latter half of his senior year, and we can get into Brandy and the senior prom if you want to. Oh, we'll get um, there. <laughs> <laughs> um, but that's what he would do. Um, so much of socializing for him was watching videos of Michael and Magic Johnson. Um, and I got my hands on these, these audio, these micro cassette tapes of him, these interviews that he had done back in the mid-'90s, and he talks about meeting Jordan really for the first time after a Sixers-Bulls game in Philadelphia. 
and Jordan tries to lobby him to go to North Carolina because that's where Michael went. And one of the things that Kobe says on the tapes is, you know, as much as I admired Michael, I, did, I was never going to go to North Carolina because I wanted to be my own man. Mm -hmm. um, it was never going to happen. So. I wanted to just read, I was very much intrigued because I wanted to talk a little bit about the ambassador that he had to be when he came back. And uh, you, you quote a, um, a, I guess, a librarian at uh, Lower Marion, Katrina Christmas. Mm -hmm. And I guess she was um, the moderator for something called the Student Voice, right? Yeah, like the Black Student The Student Union. Voice black was student the Black Union. Student Union organization okay. at Lower Marion. And you know, what, what she said to you, several black male students, some West Philly born, some are more raised, didn't like Kobe. They doubted and questioned his racial credibility. It was a charge that he couldn't escape either on the basketball court or in the halls of his high school. He was juggling a lot of stuff, wasn't he? I mean, he absolutely was. As kids would was. say now, it's a lot, right? Yeah, lot. he absolutely was. Um, you know, I, don't, I use that phrase purposefully. He really fell out of the sky in November, December of 1991. And as I get into in the book, he didn't grow up in the way that most of the black students at Lower Marion did. And he didn't grow up in the way that virtually any of the white students did. Uh, and to me, that was important to tell that aspect of the story, was what was it really like for this kid in this environment at that time? Um, what was he juggling? He's juggling, who am I really? I've spent eight years living in kind of close quarters with my family where we don't see many black faces when we walk the streets of Rieti or Pistoia or all the, you know, the towns that we've lived in while, his, while my dad is um, you know, playing basketball. And now here I am, I want to kind of get along with everybody, but I'm getting tugged in a couple different directions. You know, I'm, uh, do I fit in here? Do I not, do I fit in over there? Uh, I like rap music, so I fit in with this crowd. I'm in 10th grade honors English, so I fit in with this crowd. Um, and by the time he graduates, he's the most popular, recognizable figure on campus. Everybody loves him, he's a point of pride. But initially, Students tried to haze him because he was the new guy, mm -hmm. you know, and that's what you did to new kids, mm -hmm. whether they were six foot six and could dunk on you or not. Mm -hmm. and, and yet he made it work. I mean, he, it seemed to me from your, your reporting that I wouldn't say he used people, but he made the connections. He met people where they were, and he made the connections that would let the, that that allowed him to have a number of friends. But they never got too friendly, but they were his friends. Yes, that's right? a, that's a good way of putting it. I think there's a line in the book where I said he tried on personalities <laughs> like like clothes um, for a right. while, yeah. and I think to a degree any high school kid goes through that. Yes. Um, you're trying to figure out who you are. That's a very, you know, you're you're you, it's a tentative time in a lot of ways for for many of us. And I really kind of empathize with Kobe at that at that point and that you know and the way he felt in those regards um, but you see that and then you see what he was doing behind the scenes for instance when he's a junior and a senior where he knows he's going to jump to the NBA and he's very happy allowing the public to think he hasn't made his decision yet you know Kobe you're going to go to Duke I don't know it would be nice you're going to go to LaSalle play with play for your dad who's an assistant coach Ah, uh, be wonderful, you know? I mean, he was even doing that in 2007 when, after a game against the Sixers, I asked him, you know, would you ever consider finishing your career in Philadelphia? Yeah, I always kind of thought about that in high school. And there's always that, that question with him, that kind of mystery at the heart of him is, is he saying this because it's what he really believes? Or is he saying this because that's what he thinks you want to hear or that's what's advantageous to him? Um, you know, and that's, that's a theme that you can really explore mm -hmm. throughout his NBA career, you know, in any number of things connected to his life. Well, you know, it seems to me he was sort of managing his career from age five or yes. six. Is yeah. that right? Yeah, I think that's 100% right. Mm -hmm. He knew what he wanted to do in a way that is so rare among anybody, whether you want to be an athlete, whether you want to be a musician, a writer, you know, gosh, a construction worker, anything. It doesn't matter. Um, he, he knew and he was going to do whatever it took to get there. And that's just, I mean, that's it. That informs everything, that informs his whole story. That's, that's your North Star, is that he was going to be the greatest basketball player on the planet. He would do whatever he had to do to get there and, you know, kind of stay out of my way in some respects. 
could he have done that if he grew up in West Philly or North Philly or what do you think? If he didn't have a family, I mean, it seems to me that where he lived, he had a really strong family, uh, and they they made they 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 made ways for him to meet other people who would you know because his father had been a basketball player. Yeah, no. That's, uh, um, so I think he learned from them. Yeah, um, Ashley Howard, who's now LaSalle's men's basketball coach. Um, was a childhood friend of Kobe's, a couple years younger mm -hmm. than me. He, he told me that. He said, you know, don't forget he was groomed for this. Mm -hmm. um, and you're right, environment matters. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, in, in ways beyond the basketball court, the fact that he had lived in Italy and the fact that he grew up in Lower Marion in some ways better prepared him for, I don't know, sitting down with someone like you or me to talk to us mm -hmm. in an interview. You know, being around a kind of diverse student body in a diverse community, um, where it's not just homogenous one way or another, socioeconomically, racially, religions, any of that stuff. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think that informed a lot of his behavior um, and the way he carried himself. And I think you're right. I think there, there are a lot of advantages to him having come up the way he, that he did. It was almost kind of singular in that regard. You know, if you want to say, well, I want to be like Kobe Bryant. Okay, are you going to go travel back? You're going to have a father who played in the NBA and it didn't quite work out the way he would have wanted and you're going to travel back and forth between Italy and you're going to settle in the most diverse and, you know, uh, kind of comfortable area in suburban Philadelphia and you're going to have all these experiences and people and et cetera, et cetera. You couldn't replicate it. And, and, and to his credit, though, he was very controlled. He was, you know, I, I was stunned uh, the part you talk about that he didn't really go to a party until he was like a senior, well, I think he'd almost graduate. Or had yeah, graduated. He, he had almost graduated. It was a, what, it was teen a, what teenager would do that? Yeah, <laughs> but, but that's the way he looked at things. It was almost, mm -hmm. it was almost like um, he felt he didn't need that part of childhood, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm really, I'm stepping on the precipice of like Dr. Filling him here, and I don't want to do that. Um, but yeah, I mean, I came to think of Kobe almost as like a kaleidoscope or a diamond, like every time I tried to look at him and I turned the diamond, you could see something new, you know, or turn the kaleidoscope, you could mm -hmm. see something new. And his social life is one of them. He gets invited to a house party in Delaware County and it's the first time he's ever been to one of these things and he has a great night and enjoys himself, um, but it's not like he makes a habit of it. It's like, okay, I did that now, now I can get back to playing ball. But at the same time, he saw himself as a star. Somehow he ends up hanging out with boys to men. Yeah. They were huge in his time. And then they hook him up with Brandy, right, for the prom. Yeah, you know. I'm, I mean, It's fascinating, actually. It is. Yeah. I mean, it was, at its core, it was kind of a publicity, it, not kind of, it was a publicity stunt, um, kind of orchestrated by this promoter who had connections to boys to men and met Kobe and made it all happen. But even before that, there's a scene where Kobe is, the, the, the Lower Marion basketball team's playing in a tournament in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, and people are just kids and uh, local residents who are attending this tournament, this beach ball classic, are just lining up to get Kobe's autograph. And he's on these tapes that I got talking to Jeremy Treatman, um, his interviewer, about this, and Treatman asks him about it, and Kobe says, yeah, you know, it's just, that's gonna happen. Like, I, it's something I've gotta get used to, um, you know, and it's almost like, he's taking for granted that he's gonna be famous and this is something that he'll have to deal with and this is par for the course. Like, I'm Kobe, you know, of course I'm going to sign autographs. Why would you think otherwise? And he's 17 at the time, which is the amazing part. Of course, I can't fi quite find the quote, but I, I, we're gonna start taking questions momentarily, so uh, raise your hand if you have one. I wanted, I wanted to just hit on briefly his, his uh, his Joe and Pam, his parents, and you know you got a hundred people to talk to you, but those two were not two of them. And uh, you know I think we've all read about the you know, the problems they had when they were selling memorabilia. memorabilia. Yeah. Uh, and you'd hope you said you'd hope they at some point they'd want to read his stuff. I mean, is it you know I, I, that you know nobody cares what I think, but I, but may, I think it will make the reader sad when they get to the, to the end of the book and they see that the parents just didn't want to talk about. Uh, Th yeah. This great gift that God gave them, you know? Yeah, um, no, you're, you're right, Michael. Um, I, did, I did reach out to Joe and Pam Bryant. I wanted to speak to them. Uh, I wrote them a letter at the outset of the process, um, an old-fashioned letter. I didn't email them or anything like that, and I just said, look, I'm going to do this book. Um, I'm going to approach it with as much, you know, dignity and accuracy and honesty as I can, and it would be better for having your voices in it. 
Um, and I never heard from them directly. I heard from intermediaries. I did talk to one of Kobe's family members, his cousin, John Cox, who was almost like his little brother. Um, and I heard from other people close to the family that Joe and Pam knew I was doing the book, but they weren't going to talk to me. And they haven't spoken to anybody publicly. No one. They haven't talked to ESPN. They haven't talked to Oprah. They haven't talked to anyone. And I completely, I don't understand because I haven't been through what they've been through, but I respect that totally. Mm -hmm. um, and as I said at the end of the book, I just, my hope is that I told the story honestly, I told it accurately, and if they read the book, that it brings them just maybe something a little bit closer to joy because I can't imagine what they've been dealing with. They, the, the family had kind of fractured um, in 2001, 2002 when Kobe decided to get married. Uh, Joe and Pam thought he was too young to get married, and uh, he did not, obviously, and it, things kind of snowballed from there. Wasn't he 21? He was 21, yeah. Yeah. Um, it's, I mean, again, it's, it's something we, could, it would, we would be here for another hour kind of exploring the dynamics of that. But um, like, as I said, I hope they read the book, and I hope they come away from it with something other than just sadness. You're talking about the uh, parents. Do you know what the relationship was when he passed? I've heard intimations um, that they were trying to connect. I lost my mic. There you go. Uh, maybe I'm getting maybe I'm getting too close to it. Um, they that they were trying to make a reconciliation. Um, I don't know that that ever happened, uh, and I have to think that that's part of the reason that Joe and Pam haven't spoken publicly about it. Hey, Hi, Ben. <laughs> How you doing, buddy? Good. Um, Mike, you. You paint a picture of a guy who is uh, really transcendent in a lot of ways. And usually when you read sports stories, you know, the, the, the transcendency is the, the kid who comes up from the hard streets. Okay, and in the case of Kobe Bryant, it's the kid who, it's not that he transcends a silver spoon in his mouth, because that's not exactly a correct portrayal either. Okay, but, but he did have a lot going for him. Yes. Um, had an intact family, you know, he went to a good high school, um, was, a, was a person of intellect, that was clear, okay. Um, so, so the, the, you know, in, how would you describe his transcendency? I mean, you know, to, toward what was the end? What, what would have been the end product? I know you, you, you title the book, uh, you know, the, the in, pursuit, in Pursuit of Immortality, but, you know, that, uh, that's a little bit hyper hyperbolic okay you know no no you know but you're killing me <laughs> no, 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 no i no no real in 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 the real world you know yeah, how, how know would you, you how would you describe the the end point the the vector of his life yeah okay, I, I let mean, me put it that way okay so so there's a part in the book where i draw a direct comparison between kobe and michael jordan in that jordan never what what kobe was doing at the time that he died, was traveling this kind of narrative arc of redemption, okay? And this gets us into the thornier parts of his life with what happened in Aurora, Colorado in 2003 and 2004. Somehow, either, and it almost doesn't matter whether, whether this was genuine or whether it was just what we all perceived, but there was an impression of him that he had come out of that and was ascending again. He had put the dark parts of his experiences, a lot of which he, he himself was responsible for, behind in the public eye. And so he's becoming more of a mentor figure to NBA players in the last few years of his career. And he retires, and if there were ever an athlete who you would have thought based on the perception of him, would have struggled to find, figure out life without playing his sport. That would have been Kobe, and yet it wasn't. He found writing. He found storytelling. He won an Academy Award. He was a girl dad. He was doing all of these things. He had the Mamba Academy, and he was, I, I think part of the reason that people were so struck when he died was that there was this expectancy yet to him of, what else, what's coming next? There's more for him to do. He's finally kind of figured it out completely. He's not the jerk he's always been to his peers throughout his years in the NBA. 
and he's not this arrogant kind of unapproachable guy a lot of the time. He's finally figured it out. Now, whether that was actually happening or not, I'm not 100% sure. I think, as I said, there's always going to be this mystery at Kobe, with Kobe. But that separated him from Jordan. There was no redemptive arc for Jordan to travel. Jordan got to the final six times and won all six. The worst thing that you could have said about him in his playing career was that, okay, he gambled, which a lot of people do, so it made him almost more relatable. And then you had the, well, Republicans buy sneakers too comment, which, okay, he's soulless and he's corporate, and, and as criticisms of athletes go, that's pretty tame, all things being equal. Kobe had come back from the depths and was on, heading on a different plane both in the public's perception of him and through various indications how he himself was, was carrying himself and what he was doing. So to answer your question, I don't know what would have come next for him. I don't know. Um, and I think that, again, that when he died, I think that's part of the reason that that was an added layer of sadness and wistfulness and wondering for people was not just he was 41, but what was coming after this because there was more growing to be done. And I think he was looking for a, a higher power to help him. And the thing that I was always struck by is the day he died. And I guess he got on that helicopter, 830, 845. Mm -hmm. He and his daughter had been to Mass. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, I mean, he was, he was raised a devout Catholic. Yeah. His, his mom was very serious about it. And even into his first year with the Lakers, um, I, I didn't know this, but uh, Jeff Perlman, another author and writer, did a book about the Laker dynasty in the, in the, from about 1995 to 2005. And he had a, a detail in there, which was that during his first couple of years um, on team planes and on team buses, Kobe would watch the movie The Ten Commandments over and over and over again. And I read that and was like, oh my gosh, that makes, that makes perfect sense. You know, um, I don't know if he was, you know, mouthing Charlton Heston's lines, <laughs> you know, let my people go or what. But, um, you know, he, when you know his background, then you understand that. Mm -hmm. um, not something the typical NBA player does. So Kobe's um, influences worldwide, uh, I, 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 I seem to remember that he was wildly popular in China, which is kind of a, a contradiction because it's a culture that reveres uh, older, you know, more uh, educated people, uh, if you will. So can you speak to why uh, he was so popular in China and, and uh, in other parts of the world? Well, I think part of it, again, is a matter of circumstance in that he was the best player pardon me, in the, in the NBA, or at least one of the best players, at a time when the NBA started to branch out into China. You know, Yao Ming joins the NBA and is a cultural phenomenon and a global phenomenon. And at that time, Kobe's at the top of the heap, or at least one of the top of the heap. Um, he embraced playing in the Olympics. Uh, the 2008 games are in Beijing, and Kobe is the best player in the entire Olympics. Um, and not in a way that is selfish or self-centered. Um, he actually, I wasn't able to get into this in the book, but um, there's a podcast called The Dream Team Tapes uh, about that Olympic team, not the 92 team, but the, the 2008 team, the Redeem team. And Carmelo Anthony talks about this, about how members of that team, LeBron James, Dwayne Wade, Melo, went to Kobe and said, look, we don't need the Kobe who plays for the Lakers. You got to be a different kind of guy for us to do what we need to do. And he completely embraced that. Uh, they were saying it, and Mike Krzyzewski was saying it. So, so to be that kind of star at that time, I think probably opened the door to him becoming this this figure in China that, uh, and around the world that you know people just embraced. Mike, congratulations on the book. First Thanks, of all, Thanks, Steve. Uh, um, I wanted to ask you about. Uh, you mentioned the case in Colorado. Um, obviously, that's not what the book is about. You're covering a different time period than that. Um, it's obviously, you know, a very fraught subject, but at the same time, you know, you kind of, you can't really write a book about Kobe and not mention that, and I know you did mention it a, a couple times. What was your thought process of exactly how to deal with that in this book? So, it's funny. I was asked about this in an interview yesterday. Um, the goal in write, my goal in writing the book was to be able to have somebody read it and say, okay, now I get Kobe the man in his totality. One of the things that really worried me at the start of the process was, how am I going to handle that subject? And am I going to, what am I going to find? Is there anything I'm going to find or uncover that could allow me to treat that topic with 
this, the seriousness that it deserves and warrants without being ham-handed or kind of shoehorning it in there, if that makes sense, you know? I, I didn't want to try to paint this tapestry of Kobe and then have this hole there, if that makes sense. And I, I, that sounds really bad in a way, like I'm looking for something, but it was important to being able to tell the story fully, and that's the way crazy writers think. So um, to, to not give everything away, I did uncover an anecdote that I felt spoke to that in a way that I felt like I could just leave it kind of almost like you were leaving something on the table, and there it is, and the reader can make of it what he or she wants to make of it. Um, and so, you're right, it's really, really fraught, and I, 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 I wanted to treat it with the seriousness that it deserved, but I, didn't want, I also didn't want it to overshadow everything else about the story in a way. We live in a world of gray, and if we, if we allow, we would never be able to write about anybody, certainly not popular, important figures, if we found the one thing that they did that was reprehensible and said, I can't do it, you know? I can't do it, so I can't write about him because of X, whoever that figure might be. So my goal was to, to, to treat it with the seriousness it warranted, but tell the whole story of Kobe, if that makes sense. Hey, Mike, how you doing? Hi, good. Uh, I'm very eager to read the book. I haven't got a chance to read it, but thank what you. What are you for waiting it. for? Uh, <laughs> I'm waiting for Amazon. <laughs> <laughs> um, quick question. You touched on his parents, and, you, you know, like I said, it's well documented about the rocky relationship that he had with his parents, but what would the relationship were like with his sisters? I know he was the youngest. I would like to know, you know, maybe, you know, you touch on that a little bit. He was very close with Sharia and Shea. Um, he had two older sisters. Um, the family was very tight from having lived in Italy together. Um, they were, uh, you know, his sisters were maybe his two best friends, two of his best friends. He emulated them in a lot of ways. Um, they were both excellent athletes themselves, for instance, um, both volleyball players, uh, or at least uh, Sharia was an excellent volleyball player. Uh, she played at Temple, um, was really good, is still on their record books for now. And Shea played basketball and volleyball in high school and also played volleyball in college, including a year at uh, LaSalle when I was there. In fact, uh, one of the funny things I uncovered was LaSalle's a athletic director arranged for Shea to get a full athletic scholarship to LaSalle without the volleyball coach ever having seen her play because they thought that it would help persuade Kobe to come to LaSalle. Um, my, my fellow alumni are not going to be pleased to hear that. Um, but they, they, he was very close to them. And he looked up to them. You know, Sharia would take him around Philadelphia because she, here she is at Temple. And she would kind of show him the ropes. And when they came back from Italy, they were in some ways fish out of water. Um, I had a number of Kobe's friends describe to me that, you know, the clothes they were wearing uh, were different from everybody else's kind of European uh, sometimes African, dashikis, those sorts of things. And when they would pass each other in the hallways, they would talk in Italian um, because that was the more, A, the more natural language at the time for them in school. And number two, they could understand what each other was saying and nobody else would. Um, so they kind of had their own little click, for lack of a better way of putting it. Um, and in fact, uh, Shea lived with Kobe and Joe and Pam, his first year or two in the NBA, he bought a house in Palisades in California, and um, they all lived there. So, yeah, very close, very close to his sisters. Are they close now, do you think? Um, I mean, the sisters have not spoken, again, not spoken publicly. I, wrote, I reached okay. out to both of them, um, but no, they were, I'm sure they were devastated by, by his law, I'm sure very close to him. I think, from what I, I, don't quote me on this, I think Vanessa, Kobe's widow, is, in some contact with Good. either Sharia or Shaya. Did you have, did, had you ever interviewed Kobe prior to, to getting involved with the book? Did you have a relationship with him? And uh, clearly you had a perception about him. How much did that change if you knew him or interviewed him with all the research that you did with the book? And like, what were some of the most surprising things that, that you came out with that? Um, 
I didn't have a relationship with him. I had interviewed him and covered him. Um, I covered the 2001 finals when he cut the hearts out of the Sixers and their fans. Um, and pretty much any time the Lakers would come into town, uh, I would go to that game, you know, and if not write directly about Kobe, you know, at least listen in to interviews. And, and as I said at the end of the book, in 2007, when he was still really kind of on his, his image rehabilitation tour, um, both from the Aurora, Colorado situation and from some other things basketball related, um, I got some time with him and, and asked him about the possibility of him coming back to Philadelphia. Um, I, knew, I knew people who knew him and were close to him, so the perception I had of him was, fair, I thought, fairly well informed. And in the course of doing the research for the book, I don't know that it changed so much as it intensified. It kind of was revalidated and then some. Everybody thought Kobe, everybody perceived Kobe as being really intense and driven. I really had no idea how intense and driven until I started to do the deep dive on how he, what he was like as a kid and you know what he was like as a teenager and hearing some of the stories like, so this is funny, one of my, this is one of my favorite anecdotes in the book and I had no idea about this. So he had a friend named Matt Matkoff, who he met in eighth grade. And Matkoff was nowhere near the basketball player that Kobe was, but he kind of latched on to him and was kind of like a, you know, he was Kobe's biggest cheerleader amongst his peers. So it gets to be senior year, and Lower Marion's going to contend for a state championship. The team's really good. I mean, Kobe's far and away the best player, but they're deep enough now that they can contend for a state championship. And they're going through tryouts in the early part of the season, and Greg Downer, the head coach, says to one of his assistant coaches, Mike Egan, you know, Matt Koff, we, we just can't use him. We're going to have to cut this kid. But, but I don't want to cut him because he's Kobe, Kobe's best friend. And Mike Egan, the assistant coach, says to him, look, cut him. Kobe won't notice for two weeks. So as it turns out, Matt Koff decided not to play basketball. You don't want to say he quit, but he, he decided not to play. And sure enough, two weeks go by. And Kobe turns around at practice one day and looks around and says, where's Matkoff? That's how intense he was. And that, I don't think I really understood it to the degree that I thought I did before I started doing the deep dive into the research on him. Hey, Mike. Um, hey, Seth. I, I'd be interested to hear a little bit about the process of writing the book as compared to writing your columns. And previously as a beat reporter, I imagine there are some challenges but both opportunities involved in working on a, a longer project and something of the scope of this. Uh, I think you mentioned about 100 interviews and, and just any thoughts you have on, on the endeavor as a whole here. Well, this is, might be the worst thing I say tonight. The pandemic was great. <laughs> the pandemic helped. I couldn't go anywhere, um, but nobody else could either. So they couldn't run from me. Um, so sports stops in March of 2020. I'm not going to be going to any Sixers games. I'm not going to the, the NBA bubble in Orlando. I'm not going to any Flyers games or Big Five games or Eagles practices or anything like that. And in fact, the Inquirer moved me out of the sports columnist position for a while into more of a kind of a feature, feature writing position. Why they did that, I don't know. Uh, um, but I thank them for it because I, suddenly I wasn't writing three columns a week with no sports going on. I was writing one story every three weeks, and I could fill my hours with in, in my home office or at the Lower Marion Historical Society or on the back porch at Greg Downer's house, socially distanced, doing the research and the reporting. And I can't, when you write an 800 to 1,000 word column, you better get to the point really quickly. You, you've, got, you've got to have something to say, and you've got to get in, and you've got to get out, and you've got to make sure that you are you know, it's boom, boom, make your point. And you're very cognizant of cho choosing your words in a way um, to stick to that limit. In the book, you can write as much as you want. And in some ways, that's very liberating. That's just like, okay, like, it was much easier to write a thousand words in a day for the book than it was to write a thousand words for a column. Just much easier. Um, and part of it was because I knew nobody was gonna see it for another year. I could write it, have it down, I was going to submit it to the publisher and the editor. They were going to kick it back to me. If they didn't like it, they would tell me to cut it, that sort of thing. Um, so in some ways, there was less pressure to do that. And I just kind of maintained, 
I, I charted out at the beginning of the process, okay, I need to hit 100,000 words by this date. If I average 325 a day over the next, pardon me, 10 months, I'll hit that easy. And so there would be days I'd write 1,500, and okay, I can take a couple days off, or I finish a chapter. I reward myself, I have to write for a couple of days. Um, I see Keith kind of smiling, because you've written a book, and I'm sure you did something similar. Um, you know, that's just, it's, it's kind of what you have to do, in a way. Um, the way to eat the elephant is one bite at a time. Another and, question out there? And the hostile part is, um, <laughs> I, I'm, told, I'm told that Kobe supposedly was at a party at the house I'm now living in. And I don't is know that where right? That is in relation to the party you talked about. We'll, <laughs> we'll investigate. Well, he, all right, so, yeah. So there was a party the night that they won the, um, the day that they won the state championship game in Hershey, Pennsylvania, and this is in the book, um, the team takes the bus back and everybody heads to this one cheerleader's house for the big party to celebrate the state championship. And Kobe comes by and stays for an hour and goes home. So again, tells you a little bit about who he was back then. And, and in your book, do you talk about uh, Kobe's early days in the, in the NBA because there's a huge difference between being 18 and 22, that kind of thing, and what, what, what that was like, like relating to other players, because he's basically a kid, and the other people he's playing with are, are fully grown men, you know what I mean? Yeah, I, I didn't get into the, the actual, um, I guess you'd call it the, the physiology or the physics of him going up against older men. What was interesting about that period to me was the way he looked at it, in that even at 18, he was MFing his coach, Del Harris, because Del Harris would pull him out of a game uh, because Kobe was dribbling too much. Harris would scream at him from the sideline, this isn't high school, you can't do that, you can't dribble so much. And then Kobe would eventually come back to Jeremy Treatment and say, that blankety blank blank, he's trying to hold me down, he doesn't want to do blah blah blah. Like, that thinking, and as an 18 year old, in the, like being 18 and not starting for the team and shooting four air balls in the final game of the season of the playoffs that your team loses because you shot the four air balls didn't like humble him at all. It was like, I just gotta work harder. Um, one of my favorite anecdotes in the book, I, I love this. He's talking, Kobe's before the season begins, he's, he's ended up with the Lakers, he's been drafted, they've made the trade for him, he's gonna play with the Lakers, and his agent, Arn Tellum, Philadelphia native, Lower Marion native, is talking to him about players in the NBA. And he mentions to him John Stockton. Now, John Stockton was the point guard of the Dream Team. This is 1996. He's about to lead the Utah Jazz to back-to-back -back NBA Finals where they lose to Michael Jordan and the Bulls twice. Probably as good a team as it ever has lost, has not won a championship. Stockton's one of the three best point guards in NBA history. But he's six foot two and white. And so when Tellum asks him, what are you gonna do with John Stockton? Kobe says, ah. Faced a lot of guys like him in the Philadelphia Catholic League. <laughs> like, it, he just reduced the best point guard in the NBA to a cultural stereotype like <laughs> that. And it was, he's 18, but that's the way he thought. And I don't, maybe, not maybe, he probably needed to think that way to become the athlete and the player that he was. But yeah, you can look at it from a, purely from a statistical standpoint, you can look and see, like, he needed to, he needed to bulk up. Look at him at that time when he's 18. You know, he needs to bulk up. He needs to mature physically. And you can, it's reflected in his performance that season. His second year, he's an all-star, even though he isn't really a starter for the Lakers. Um, he wins the slam dunk contest his, his rookie year, comes back the following year, and is an all-star. But if any of you saw The Last Dance, Michael Jordan absolutely abuses him in that all-star game and makes a point of we're gonna go after that kid. And it was at Madison Square Garden and he just, he tears Kobe up. At least on, when Kobe's on defense anyway. Yeah, and yet every, any, everybody who's anybody was at his funeral and, and, and sobbed, right? Yeah, I mean, you know, again, I think a lot of that gets back to the man by all accounts, and ostensibly, he was becoming at the time that he died. Um, you know, in some ways, he had become kind of this guru. Um, I've been doing a, a, in addition to the book, there's a podcast that's accompanying, kind of complimenting the book. 
And on that podcast, you can hear these tapes that Kobe, um, these interviews that Kobe did when he was 18, 17, 18, 19. And I just, for the most recent one, I just interviewed Seth Curry and Tobias Harris from the Sixers because I wanted contemporary, NBA contemporaries and current players to speak to this. And uh, Tobias Harris really spoke very well about how there was something about him, that, that inner drive, that total commitment to being great, the idea that when you're home, he's working. The idea that when you're 12 and you're playing pickup and then you go home after you finish your game, he's there icing his knees like he saw his dad and all his dad's teammates do, and he is wearing knee pads during the game and you know, do, watching video and doing all of these things to get himself better because he wants that edge on you. And Tobias said that's, that's why people admire him so much. Well, Mike, I think we're all going to be looking forward to your next book on Kobe. <laughs> uh, we'll see. One's enough for now. One's Thanks. enough for now. Great, great discussion. Thanks so much. Thank you, everybody.